Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes nummer 1399 met een uitzending voor vandaag 2 september 2018. Dat is het bulletin van zondag. Ik doe nog steeds rustig aan vandaag met een eenvoudige uitzending. Omdat er gisteren zoveel positieve reacties op kwamen. Opnieuw een aflevering van Plain Tales. Ging het gisteren over de eenheden en de lengte en breedtegraden. Vandaag gaat het over de praktijk van de navigatie en de communicatie met enkele concrete voorbeelden van zowel dingen die goed als fout gaan. Plaintails is onderdeel van de Airline Pilot Guy. De website kun je vinden op airlinepilotguy.com. The remainder of this bulletin will be in English. Today we have another episode of Plaintails. Today's title is Lost. It's December 1978. And a small Cessna 188 crop sprayer was island hopping across the Pacific Ocean bound for Australia. Retired U.S. Navy pilot Jay Prochnow was at the controls and alone in the sky. He should have had a colleague for mating on him in a similar craft, but a crash on takeoff out of Pago Pago that morning had left his fellow pilot unharmed but unable to accompany him. Prochnow had landed back to assist, but there was nothing to be done, and the following day he set out on his own. The tiny craft was a dot over the vast ocean as it crossed the 1,700 miles that separated the two islands, an ocean that must have seemed an awful lot larger when, after many hours of flying, Norfolk Island failed to appear. Prochnow was navigating by using an automatic direction finder, an aerial-driven device that showed the pilot a compass bearing to a beacon, but when he had turned it to several beacons and found that the readings weren't correct, he realized it had failed. Prochnow wasn't in immediate danger. He still had plenty of fuel, but his aircraft was only really equipped for day visual conditions and the sun was starting to sink low in the sky. Hoping that his dead reckoning navigation had been reasonably accurate, his first action was to start flying an expanding box pattern that would allow him to cover an increasingly large area of sea around him. Hopefully he would spot the island of Norfolk before he ran out of fuel. Realising he also needed assistance from outside, particularly if he ended up ditching, he called Auckland Air Traffic Control Centre on his long-range HF radio and declared an emergency. The cards were stacked against our intrepid Cessna pilot, but fate was about to deal him a break because in the skies way above him was an Air New Zealand DC-10 and sitting in the captain's seat was Gordon Vitti. VT wasn't a run-of-the-mill captain. Trained as an engineer by Tasman Empire Airways, he won the Jeffrey Roberts Prize for Top Apprentice, whilst also learning to fly at the Auckland Aero Club. He joined the Royal New Zealand Air Force as a flying instructor, working through his instructor's grades until he became a rare A1 rated QFI. Rejoining the civil world of flying, he obtained both his air transport pilot's license and his flight navigator's license, and rejoined his previous employer, now called Air New Zealand. Within a few short years, VT had his command on the DC-6. He progressed through various aircraft types until becoming an instructor on the DC-10, and on that fateful day, he was bound for Auckland out of Fiji. Once he had been informed that a fellow airman in the gathering gloom beneath him was calling Mayday, he gathered his resources. Fortunately, he had spare fuel to use in the search, and following an explanation to his passengers, he ended up with a volunteer, also a navigator, on the flight deck assisting. Since neither the Cessna pilot nor anyone else knew where the little craft was, Vitti had to work from absolute basics and from a lifetime of knowledge and experience. By this time, contact had been made with the crop sprayer on the long HF radio, so he instructed Prochnow to aim his aircraft at the sun and read his compass heading. The answer came back as 274 degrees, whereas the DC-10 had a reading of 270 degrees. This meant that the Cessna was heading a little more to the right than Vette had to, 
which placed the lone pilot to the south of the airliner. Now VT told the other pilot to reach out with his arm and measure the height of the sun above the horizon, using his fingers as a gauge. It was a crude sextant. Each finger would be about two degrees, and using the one in sixty rule, each degree would be worth about sixty nautical miles. Corrected for their altitude difference, the measure showed that the Cessna was to the west of the DC-10. Combining the two discoveries, Vitti knew he had to fly southwest to find the lost aircraft. Up to now, communications have been made using HF radio, which bounces its long frequency waves off the ionosphere. The two aircraft turned their shorter range VHF radios to the same frequency and they began calling each other. These radios only work by line of sight, so calculating the curvature of the Earth and compensating for their altitude difference, Viti worked out that when they made contact they would be within 200 miles of each other. The previous calculations proved correct and the aircraft closed on each other until at last Viti could hear Prochnow's voice. He continued until the voice faded again and then turned through 90 degrees flying a box pattern, alternately making and losing contact whilst carefully plotting their position on a map. VT knew that the radio range was a 400 mile diameter circle and when enough points had been made on the circumference he could join the bisectors and then run lines perpendicular to them to the centre of the circle. That's where the Cessna should be. In the meantime it was getting darker and flying was becoming a problem for Prochnow but the setting sun was actually going to help. Norfolk Island was asked to give the exact time the sun set, as was the Cessna pilot. The corrected time difference put the aircraft 290 miles away from safety. Viti had set off for the estimated position of the little aircraft, and he then dumped some of his precious fuel in the hope that he might be seen and the position confirmed. Prochnow saw nothing and having now been airborne for over 20 hours, he was running very short of fuel. A P-3 Orion was launched in the hope that they might help him in the almost inevitable ditching that was going to come. In the DC-10, Viti couldn't understand what had gone wrong, but in fact, they hadn't gone wrong at all. Their fuel dump had been so accurate, it was right on top of the aircraft and impossible for the pilot to see through that part of the canopy. By now, Viti had the internal lights of his aircraft dimmed and every window had a keen passenger's face pressed to the glass as everyone on board tried to help with the rescue by spotting the lost plane. The DC-10 put all its strobes and landing lights on to try to help and then Prochnow saw something. It, it was a light, but as he closed on it, he realised it was an oil rig. Back at Auckland, the phones turned red hot as they tried to work out who this might be, and before long the name Penrod surfaced, a rig being towed from New Zealand to Singapore. Initially there was confusion, but eventually the exact position of the Penrod was established and Viti rendezvoused with it, giving the Cessna an accurate heading to fly to Norfolk. Close to midnight, and after over 23 hours of flying, eight hours past its ETA, the Cessna landed safely on Norfolk Island. Prochnow had stretched his aircraft's expected endurance by over an hour by carefully leaning out his fuel, but when he shut down his tanks were empty. For this outstanding feat of leadership and airmanship, Gordon Vitti would receive the Johnson Memorial Award from the Guild of Air Pilots and Navigators and the President's Award from McDonnell Douglas. But this wasn't the defining time of this fine pilot's life. That was still to come. In the following year, Air New Zealand began to fly sightseeing tours of the Antarctic in their DC-10s. 
The aircraft swept up McMurdo Sound and around Mount Erebus, a 12,500-foot-high volcano, all to the commentary of an expert. The 14th of these such flights had a replacement captain who had yet to fly this unusual charter, but he had attended a full briefing 19 days before. The crew were in contact with McMurdo Radar Station and given permission to continue visually below 10,000 feet. Their minimum height was limited to 6,000 feet, but photographic evidence from previous trips showed that this limit was being routinely ignored. The aircraft descended below a 2,000-foot cloud layer and the crew monitored their position by keeping coastlines some 10 miles either side in view. Without warning, the ground proximity warning system alarmed and only six seconds later the aircraft impacted into the side of Mount Erebus, killing everybody on board. The accident stunned the nation and the recovery of the wreckage and the bodies proved to be enormously difficult. The investigation was published only six months later and found that the cause was pilot error, placing the blame squarely on the crew. It was here that Gordon Vette re-enters the story. He had trained Jim Collins, the dead captain, and knew him to be both capable and careful. He also knew the flight engineer well, as he had been part of his crew that so capably aided the lost Cessna. Vitti believed that to have done what the investigation suggested, there would have to have been an unlikely level of simultaneous incompetence on behalf of all the crew members. Despite the loss of many friends, his job and his health, Gordon Vitti set about vindicating the crew. His work brought to light the importance of a navigational change to the routing that the crew had not been briefed about that shifted their route 30 miles eastward. He refuted the belief that the crew were flying in poor visibility by presenting images from passengers' cameras recovered from the wreckage. Above all, his investigation into the phenomena of whiteout the deceiving visual errors that can occur when looking at white-on-white -white terrain proved very important. He began a campaign to re-examine the causes of the accident, but was rebuffed by the airline. However, eventually a royal commission of inquiry was opened under Mr Justice Mann of the High Court. After no fewer than four lengthy delays, it was finally concluded that the aircrew were not to blame, and Justice Mann stated that some of the counter-evidence he had heard was no more than an orchestrated litany of lies. This was, however, far from the end. An appeal against claims and costs was upheld, although the findings on the cause of the accident were not challenged. Further claims involved the Privy Council in London, and Justice Mann finally resigned from the bench in disgust. However, despite all the lies, deceit and obscuration, it was the professionalism and dedication to his fellow pilots that Captain Vitti showed that could be seen as a beacon of hope for the families of those involved. His work on the flat light phenomena led to the development of forward-looking ground proximity warning systems, and his analysis of the human factors involved is still widely used by ICAO. He was made an honorary life member of the New Zealand Airline Pilots Association and was the first to be presented with the Jim Collins Memorial Award for Exceptional Contributions to Flight Safety. He was appointed an Officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit and in 2009 received a Presidential Citation from the International Federation of Airline Pilots. It took until 1999 for the New Zealand Parliament finally to give official acknowledgement. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. 
Alle mail is welkom op het adres x, xdv.me. Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De Daily Minutes komt tot stand mede dankzij de stichting Scope Hobbyfonds. Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Echo Tango Echo. En microfoon naar retour.